life is yours My hope is in you only My heart you hold You made this sinner holy and holy
Hello, everyone, and welcome to this time of online praise and our message here with North County Church. So glad you're joining with us this morning, and we hope that the things that we share today will draw you closer to Christ and build you up spiritually, and in this particular message, help to equip you more to share your faith with others. We're going to be looking at an early incident in the ministry of Jesus where he calls some of his initial disciples who will become apostles. You're going to recognize the names that are in this text. Luke chapter 5, we're going to be looking in just a couple of moments at verses 1 through 11. This is a place where Jesus catches the disciples in a moment of personal discouragement, no doubt, in their life. They've put in a hard night working and it has produced nothing for them. So they're about to end a day of hard work as fishermen with nothing to show for it. Maybe you've experienced that in your own life. No doubt all of us have. Luke chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So, they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. I want you to think about this passage with me for just a couple of moments. Again, I mentioned that these men were at a place of discouragement. When Jesus comes to them and tells them to put out into the deep, they said, Master, we have worked all night long and have caught nothing. Isn't that a statement that describes life for so many of us? We work, and as the King James Version says, we toil hard, and sometimes it feels as if nothing happens. Nothing is produced. Some of you might remember the cartoon character Ziggy. I saw a cartoon of his not too long ago. He was seated on a chair in his living room, and the caption simply read, Yesterday, opportunity knocked on my door but I was out back taking out the garbage. Have you ever felt discouraged like that, wondering if the opportunities of life might be passing you by? I think all of us have probably grown discouraged at some time because, again, we work hard at certain things only to see the fruit of our labor produce very little or nothing at all. So as you read in this particular text, you can hear these feelings of discouragement in the words of these fishermen. Two fishing boats stand empty by the side of the lake. The fishermen, they've given up for the day. They're standing near the boats and they're washing and mending their nets, something that fishermen would do as they're getting ready to put things away and go and get some rest. Their faces are no doubt weary with discouragement. These are guys who don't fish for sport. Uh, You've seen the bumper sticker that says a bad day fishing is better than a good day working, right? Well, this is their work, and they've had a very discouraging time fishing. 
And whether you're a fisherman or in some other kind of work, you've probably experienced that same kind of discouragement. If you're a salesperson, perhaps you've known what it's been to make call after call, to go to prospect after prospect, only to be told no over and over again. Somebody said once that matinees at movie theaters are for salespeople who can't handle one more rejection. Or maybe you've poured your resources and your capital into a business to start a business and while you've experienced many rewards, perhaps, you've also had those times of setback where you've worked so hard, it seems that the wolf always stands poised at the door. Maybe you grew up on a farm and you realize the sinking feeling that these fishermen experienced when a crop is about to fail. And it's not because you haven't worked hard. That's the frustrating part. Maybe you've worked harder than ever, but the rains came at the wrong time. One week sooner, you would have had a bumper crop. Even our young people, they know about this. They, they know of times of discouragement. Maybe they've studied hard, worked to prepare for a test in school, but they get to school and suddenly realize they've studied the wrong chapter. They'd hoped for an A, and now they're just hoping that they can pass the test. I mean, we know the feeling of these fishermen. We know that they've worked hard. And yet, like so much of life, life can be discouraging. I read about a troubled man who went to visit his rabbi. He was wringing his hands and he said, Rabbi, I'm a failure. More than half the time, I don't succeed in what I must do. So the rabbi said, is that right? He said, listen, I want to give you some wisdom. I want you to go and look on page 930 of the New York Times Almanac for the year 1970, and then maybe you'll find peace of mind. Maybe. So the man took the rabbi's advice. He went away and he did that very thing. And on page 930, he found the batting averages of some of the greatest baseball players of all time at that time. As a matter of fact, Ty Cobb, one of the greatest sluggers of all time, he read, had a lifetime batting average of only 367. Even Babe Ruth didn't do so good. So the man went back to the rabbi and said in a kind of questioning tone, Ty Cobb? 367? That's it? The rabbi said, that is exactly right. Ty Cobb, 367. He got a hit once out of every three times at bat. Not even Ty Cobb batted 500. So what do you expect already? The man said, I've got the point. Here he had thought himself to be a wretched failure because he only succeeded in what he perceived to be half the time. So, discouragement, it's a part of life. All of us get discouraged at times. We can sympathize then with these fishermen standing beside their boats, cleaning their nets with absolutely nothing to show for their labors, and all they can now show are clean nets and hope for a better tomorrow. But then Jesus enters into the scene. Here is the answer to all discouragement, to all disillusionment, to all debasement. Let Jesus step in to the scene of your life and bring new meaning and a whole new purpose to your life. There was a noted criminal lawyer of another day named Clarence Darrow who was quite well known in America. He had among his friends a young minister, which seemed kind of strange because Darrow was usually thought of as an unbeliever. Well, they're talking one day and, and Mr. Darrow began to reminisce and he talked about his career and he talked about some of the great cases and famous trials of which he'd been a lawyer for the defense. He said, this has been a rather exciting life. He went on to make at least a comfortable fortune and modestly, he guessed he might be regarded by many as a success. But then, Mr. Darrow asked, Would you like to know what my favorite Bible verse is? His friend said, Indeed, I would. 
So Mr. Darrow said, you'll find it in Luke chapter 5 at verse 5, and he quoted from the King James Version, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. And then he added this. He said, in spite of my success, that verse seems to sum up the way I feel about life. Mr. Darrow, with all of his accomplishments, still had this emptiness in his life, an emptiness that only Jesus Christ can feel, or fill, I should say. For those of you who think that your life is going to be filled with meaning and purpose, if you can achieve more or acquire more, I want you to think again about that. Let's go back over our text and let's make a couple of observations from this particular passage. The first thing that you'll notice in this particular text is that Jesus came on the scene of this discouraging set of circumstances and he asked them to perform a simple act of faith. A simple act of faith. Here's what he said at verse 6. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now again, I want you to think about that. These fishermen have worked hard all night. They've caught absolutely nothing. They're weary in mind and weary in body, and they're just ready to go home and get some sleep. And then Jesus steps in to this particular scene, and notice what Jesus told them to do. He told them to launch out into the deep water. He told them to drop their nets down for a catch of fish. Now understand this. Once a fisherman has washed and mended his nets, the last thing that he wants to do at that particular moment is go back out onto the lake and throw them back into the lake because it's only going to mean having to wash them again. The nets were large. They were heavy. It was a lot of work to clean the nets. Cleaning them was a major task. And so what he's really telling them to do is to exercise their faith. And it was Peter, as you realize, who speaks up. He's often the one to speak out. He said, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything but don't you love Peter's then follow-up to that statement? He said, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And we just read it. You know what happened next. They brought in so many fish that they nearly sank their boats. And it would have never happened had they not exercised their faith in our Lord Jesus. There's a story from sailing ship days about a vessel that was stranded off of the coast of South America. They were unable to advance because there was absolutely no wind. It was so still. Week after week went by, the sailors were dying of thirst when a schooner drifted close enough to read their frantic signals for help. And then back came the answer, let down your buckets. And when they did, they found water fit to drink beneath their keel, far from the coast, though they were. The freshwater current that was flowing beneath them from the mighty Amazon River surrounded them, and all they had to do was reach down for it. That's what Jesus asked these fishermen to do. Let down your nets. Jesus had a power, and he knew something that they didn't know, he could see what they couldn't see, and he could make happen what they could never make happen by their own strength or skill or ingenuity. So Jesus said, all I want you to do is put out and drop down your nets. Now, there are a number of lessons that you and I can draw from this particular text. Some people, they read this and they see it as a lesson in perseverance. You know, if you just refuse to yield to failure, just go after it one more time and you'll succeed. I don't think there's a lesson here about sticking to a job. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that 
we should abandon anything prematurely. I just don't think that's the point of this particular text. There have been some who've seen here a lesson in prosperity. Some have said, hey, put your faith in Jesus Christ and he'll make your business a success and he'll make you prosper. Boy, if that was the end goal, the end purpose of what Christ was doing here, he would have told them to just keep fishing. Man, build their business. He'd make it even more successful. Instead, what did they do? Well, as you read down at verse 11, they left everything, including their nets and their boats, and they followed Jesus. So I don't believe this is a lesson on prosperity either. Jesus was illustrating a very simple point to them that would help to prepare them for their coming ministry if the master says to do something, then trust him. Act in faith and do it. So if you want to be equipped to go out and fulfill the purposes of, of Jesus in your life, when you read the statements of Jesus and hear the things that he's telling you to do, don't quibble with Jesus. Don't argue with Jesus. Just simply do what the master tells you to do. Trust him and do it. Second observation here. Jesus was leading them toward a greater mission in life than that of simply catching fish. He wanted them to catch people. He wanted them to become fishers of men, fishers of people. So, they were going to learn how to go out and fish for men and women in order to bring men and women into the kingdom of God. This is so exciting. The kingdom of God is coming. And it's coming in Jesus. And Jesus is inviting these men now to give their lives to something far greater than just making a living, than just getting up day after day and doing the same things and repeating the same cycle. He is calling them in to the mission of participating with him in the work of the kingdom of God and drawing men and women into it. Jesus would tell many parables about the nature of the kingdom of heaven. As you read through the parables of Jesus, you'll see that he had a parable that would be effective for farmers. He told the parable of the sower. He had a parable that would be effective for the business people. He told the parable of the hidden treasure. And he had a parable that would really drive the point home for so many of them who were fishermen. It's found in Matthew chapter 13 at verse 47 down to verse 50. Let's read it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. I'm relatively sure that when Peter, James, and John listened to that part of the story, they probably smiled and said, well, we know exactly what he's talking about. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. I got ahead of you a little bit there on the text. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, I'm sure that when Peter, James, and John heard this particular story coming from the mouth of their Savior, they thought of their own experience that day when they had put their nets down and brought in this great haul of fish. And now what happened there is becoming all the more clearer to them. Remember that story I told you a few moments ago about Clarence Darrow, whose favorite passage in the Bible was Luke 5.5, 5, We have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Well, Peter and his fellow fishermen are about to embark on an entirely new course of life, a life in which their purpose will not be tied to an occupation or to some level of achievement here, but to the mission of God for their life. And that mission would fill their hearts and their minds with purpose because the results of this, this new mission they were embarking on would be eternal. 
Some of us might look at verse 5 and we'd say, wow, I mean, that's fanaticism. They got carried away. And indeed, they did get carried away and carried along by a vision that Christ had instilled in them, that vision being that their life would not simply be about hard work and the hope of some payoff in the here and now, but that their very labor moving forward would contribute to the coming of and the advancement of the very kingdom of God. And the point of this particular passage is not that every person should abandon their particular vocation or job to become an evangelist and that you're less committed to the Lord if you don't. I mean, certainly that was the case for Simon Peter and these other fishermen. He and these would go on to become uh, some of the 12 apostles who would become messengers of Christ who would form the very foundation of the church with a very special mission. But that wasn't true for everybody. I mean, think about Lydia. She most likely kept selling purple uh, in Thyatira when she became a disciple of Christ. And think about the jailer in Acts chapter 16. He probably continued being a jailer after his baptism in that particular passage. Paul taught the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, keep on working with your hands and to mind your own business. The point of this particular passage is that if you yield your life to Jesus Christ, he will infuse your life with a whole new purpose. And your role even in the workplace will be infused with new meaning. He will use you as salt and light, whether it's in your workplace or on your campus, suddenly going to school. If you're a young person who really yields your heart to Christ, going to school can take on a much larger meaning when you realize that you are placed there as Christ's presence, as a part of the mission of Christ in our world. Everything takes on a new purpose and a new meaning. If you're a mom working in the home through the week, you are catching people in the kingdom nets when you teach and model the love of Christ and the words of Christ. Now, there may be those who take heed and they sense a call to forsake their vocations and, and maybe go abroad as a missionary or do ministry full-time uh, domestically uh, to preach the gospel. We need some who will take those steps. The need perhaps has never been greater. But here's the point. Everyone has a new mission. Their life, once they come to Christ, is about something altogether new and different and richer and deeper and eternal. All of our lives take on new meaning when we make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. We are called where we are to be men and women who catch people for the kingdom. And our work has purpose that's eternal. It's not just about a payoff here. And that leads me to a final observation in this message today. Jesus isn't asking us to be responsible for the catch. He asks us to simply put down our nets. Some of you might be thinking, I'm not very effective, I'm not very skillful, I'm not very gifted, I would never make an effective person in evangelizing others and bringing them into the kingdom. But the point of this particular parable is, it's not about how effective or skillful or talented or gifted you may be, it is about what Jesus can do in us and through us when we simply yield our lives to him. All he's asking us to do is not be responsible for the catch. They couldn't be responsible for the catch. They were just simply asked to put down their nets into the deep. So let me ask you this today, follower of Christ. Have you been launching into the deep? Fishing for people, it takes some risk. As it was with the case of Peter and these other fishermen, it, it takes a willingness to do some things that you, by nature, may not want to do at first, that may not even seem logical or rational to you at first. And it may be that you don't feel worthy to try catching people for Christ. 
People know too much about your past, perhaps. You say, boy, they, they know what my life has been about. Your life before you were a Christian. Man, they'd never listen to me. I think it's interesting in this particular text that Jesus chose those who might be unlikely fishermen for people to step out into this mission. I mean, why call these? Peter was painfully aware of the sin in his own life. And when he saw the miracle that Christ performed here, as you read there in Luke chapter 5, what does he do? He falls down at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. When you really let it take hold in your heart of who Jesus is, maybe you look at Christ and you look at the glory of Jesus and you're starting to learn who he is and you say about Jesus, I am far too unworthy to ever be accepted by this man, let alone used by this man. That was Peter. He falls down in absolute brokenness and contrition. Lord, go away from me. After he sees that miracle, he knows he's in the presence of God's very son. And he says, go away, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And what did Jesus say to him? Jesus looked him in the eyes and said, Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch people. If you decide to give yourself to Jesus Christ, he'll take your life and cleanse it. He'll cleanse you of all your sin. He'll forgive your past and he'll give you new life and he'll give you a new mission. He will use you to catch others. So it means being ready to fish for people who seem like unlikely candidates. Jesus took hold of our hearts and we, like Peter, might see ourselves as unlikely candidates. And then if we go out to fish, it means that we need to be willing to go after others who seem like unlikely candidates. And to just, to use another metaphor, scatter the seed indiscriminately and let it fall into human hearts to see who will respond. When they cast out their nets, they didn't line fish. They cast out a net to bring in, as the parable says, all who would come into that net. John Wesley, he was stopped one night by a man out on the highway who robbed the minister of everything that he had. Wesley said to the man who was robbing him, if the day should come that you desire to leave this evil way and live for God, I want you to remember that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. How many would think to say that to a man who was robbing them? Man, you talk about an unlikely prospect, an unlikely candidate. But some years later, Wesley was stopped by a man after a church service who said, Do you remember me? The man said, I robbed you one night. And you told me about the blood of Jesus Christ and how it cleanses from all sin. He said, I want you to know Christ has changed my life. Fishing for people means being willing to remove oneself from the safety of the docks where the nets are washed to launch out into the deep. So let me ask you again the question, where have you launched your nets recently? Have you invited your next door neighbor to attend worship? Have you reached out to a friend at school and encouraged them to come and join with you in a youth activity? Or in this particular context, maybe at one of our evening gatherings. Of course, I know right now students are working online, so this takes a new level of creativity in inviting people but maybe you can let people know that we have a gathering every week. There's a spiritual hunger, all indicators are saying, of people in our culture today with all that's happening in 2020. There's a spiritual hunger where people are starting to search and seek. And this may be a great opportunity, maybe one of our greatest opportunities, to cast out our nets in creative ways and to put them out there and to see who might respond. I remember when I was in high school, a friend of mine in our youth group asked me, I was a senior at one high school and she went to a campus, it was an open campus. She said, 
I'm thinking about getting a little Bible study going on my campus at lunch, and I'm wondering if you would come and lead it and just talk about some of the simple parables of Jesus. And so I thought, well, if she's open, I'm open. So at lunchtime, I left my own campus, went over to hers that was nearby, and we started this little Bible study. And one by one, we started seeing students come to faith in Christ and be baptized into Christ. It was a risk. Somebody might say, high school students? Come on, there's not a spiritual hunger there, is there? And yet there really is. It's one of the most open times for a person to potentially be responsive to the gospel. What started out with two or three ended up being 15 to 20, week after week at lunchtime, opening up the Word of God. And there's example after example of people launching out into the deep, just taking some risks, just saying, let's put down the nets and see who Jesus brings into the nets. So where are you casting your nets. And keep this in mind, and this is so important and it's a part of this text, you're simply called to fish. When they did what Christ told them to do, they caught such a large number of fish that their boats began to break. Their nets began to break. Jesus is responsible for the haul. He just calls us to put out our nets. He doesn't say that we have to make things happen ourselves. In fact, this idea is found throughout Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is speaking to the church there because they're getting pretty impressed by men, by preachers, and they're lining themselves up or aligning themselves with certain popular preachers. Hey, I'm a Paul, I'm a Peter, I'm a... And on and on it went. So Paul reminded them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose and each will be rewarded according to his labor. It's a farming analogy, not a fishing one, but it fits very much our message. In addition, Paul taught that you never know when opportunity to lead another to Christ might appear in your life. So you ought to be praying for opportunities. And then if you're going to pray for opportunities, keep your eyes open and redeem the opportunities around you. He said in Colossians chapter 4 at verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It's as if Paul is saying, pray for opportunities, watch for opportunities. See every contact with somebody who doesn't know Jesus as an opportunity to maybe bring them to Christ. Watch the way you speak. Let your speech be seasoned with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you'll know how to answer everyone because you never know when God is going to, through that opportunity, and through that seed that's planted and watered, draw somebody to Christ. So, let me encourage you, Christian, put out into the deep. Let down your nets. Pray for opportunities. Look around you. Seize opportunities. Extend invitations. Encourage people to watch our messages week to week in our present environment. Maybe invite somebody to one of your outdoor life groups where people are meeting outdoors and just talking about the Word or to our Sunday night gathering at Great Day Park where people can hear Christ and hear the worship and have seeds planted and seeds watered. Let's be a people putting down our nets. Let's meet the spiritual hunger of our time with the food that we know can and will fill it. 
We just put it out there. So, brothers and sisters, I hope you'll take this as a challenge and a reminder of the call that, that whether or not you're one that ever leaves your profession or your vocation or stays right in it, that wherever you are, Jesus has called us to fish for people. Now, if you're watching this, and maybe you're one of those people that God is reaching through our message today, I'd encourage you to let us help you take a next step toward Christ. If you want to know more about how to enter into his kingdom, how to have your own sins forgiven, how to start the new life that Peter was brought into 2,000 years ago, if you want to know how to have your sins forgiven, and to be what the Bible says is a saved person, then let us know how we can help. You can email me at info at northcountycfc.com. That is info at northcounty, not cfc.com, but info at northcountycfc.org. Info at northcountycfc.org. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to help you. All right, folks, hope to see you tonight at 6 p.m. If you're able to be with us at Great Day Park in Escondido, we're going to have another time of worship tonight at 5.30, not 6 p.m., 5.30. Again, if you're able to come, if your health allows it, and you're willing to get out with other people, we'd welcome you. Bring a mask, bring a chair, and it's as simple as that. May God bless you this week.